Hello. Our story begins at the Jedi Temple. The council was in transport to Naboo for the celebration of the victory of Naboo and the burial of Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn. Master Dooku looked at himself in his mirror. He stood silently in his room, looking down at his cape and boots strewn across the ground and bed. His eyes raised and he met his lifeless gaze. Dooku was appalled for many reasons, and he felt a fit of rage and hysterics rise up from within him. It's why he threw his boots at the wall, and it's why he ripped his cape off in disgust. The Jedi Master was left without his apprentice, someone he loved like a son, and someone he considered his best friend. Qui-Gon was such a good man, and he had grown up so fast. How could it be that he was gone? Dooku was in the initial stages of grief. Qui-Gon couldn't die before him, that's not how it was supposed to go. It was something Yoda understood, but why would Dooku speak to his master? It was Yoda's fault Qui-Gon went to Naboo alone, but if it was Yoda's fault, whose fault was it that Maul killed him? Dooku remembered their final conversation. It was one of warning, because Dooku knew the truth. He knew the Sith had returned, and he was going to be a part of their return. Dooku's hands creased around the edge of the sink in front of him as he tightened his grip and then released it. A lifetime of Yoda's teachings ran through his mind at the same time. Grief is a natural part. The Force surrounds you. Resist the darkness. Control. Control. You must learn control. Fear is the path to the dark side. Dooku stopped and stepped away from the mirror, shying away from seeing a tear slip down his cheek. He couldn't continue this way of life. As a Jedi, he was supposed to be stronger than this, and as a Jedi, he was supposed to just accept his student's death. But that was something he could not do. The Jedi Master kicked his boots across the room as they slammed into the door, and then he slammed himself down onto his bed, rubbing his hands across his face in disgust. Would the young man that was once the apprentice of the Grand Master of the Jedi Order stand for this? He killed his best friend, he lied, and he cut information out of the Jedi Archives. Dooku had done so many wrong things and now his student was dead. Did his desire to change the fate of the Republic and the Jedi do this? Did he destroy himself because he wanted to save the people of the galaxy from corruption? Or did he sell his soul to the devil in hopes that he would be given the forbidden fruit of the free galaxy? Dooku pondered and pondered, feeling his head rise up with a burdening headache and a sudden urge to wander the halls of the temple. Dooku threw his boots on and went on without his cape. It was an odd sight for sure, but Dooku didn't care. He stepped into the hall and stopped. He turned back at the door and remembered an eager young Qui-Gon Jinn waiting for him. It was their first day of training and Qui-Gon was waiting by Dooku's door. He smiled, remembering how frightened he was when he stepped out of his room to see the young Jedi Padawan looking into his eyes. His fist clenched and he released his grip. Qui-Gon Jinn was one with the Force now. It was time to let go, and time to forget. Dooku turned his head and started walking the halls. Ever since he heard the news about his former student's death, he had been near inconsolable. Yoda tried to speak with him, but he was cut out, so Yoda let Dooku have his time to heal. Several peers and friends came to him to wish their condolences as well. The Jedi Master would receive more of those during this walk, which only added to the burning pain in his chest. Dooku went to the archives where he found himself blankly wandering around. He eventually found himself at a table and just stared off in the distance without a thought behind his eyes. All he saw were memories forming in front of him, playing on a continuous loop. The first instruction, the first spar, the first meditation, the first mission, the knighting, the first student he watched Qui-Gon take on and so much more. It continued going and going and going until it was interrupted by a Jedi Master who asked him how he was doing. Dooku looked over to Imma Gundim, who slid down in the seat across from him. Dooku told him that he was accepting what had been done and coming to terms with what couldn't be reversed. Master Gundy could tell that the Jedi Master was lying, so he offered an alternative. He told Dooku that when he lost his friend and his master during a mission, he went on a bearish vow. Dooku looked at his hands, which were on the table, and he nodded his head. Inside his mind, he considered taking this bearish vow to join the Sith. But this wasn't a bad idea. Ima Gundy could tell that Dooku was conflicted, so he let him have his space, getting up and patting Dooku on the shoulder and telling him that they were all here for him if he needed anything. Dooku sat alone for several more minutes, trying to think of what he actually wanted to do going forward. His mind kept on racing, he considered continuing his path with Darth Sidious, and then he thought about what would happen if he took the Barish Vow instead. Technically he'd be taking a hiatus from the Jedi Order as it was, that was something he could afford to do. Master Dooku got up and walked to the council chambers. He always came here when the council wasn't present. It was a calming space to be in, 
and he was always able to access the council chambers because of Yoda. Dooku walked through the doors and looked over the sunset falling on Coruscant. It was a beautiful day, and it was all visible from this tower. Dooku stood silently with his eyes watching the shadows fade on the towers of glass as the sun fell behind the horizon. Dooku looked down at the ground and then over to the other council seats. He was supposed to be a member of this council. If he had joined, would it have saved Qui-Gon's life? As these thoughts ran through his mind, he felt the chill roll down his spine. The Jedi Master looked over and shook his head, returning to his gaze at the cityscape. Dooku tried to return to his concentration, but it felt like there was something else going on here. He could feel the presence of someone so close. Dooku grabbed his lightsaber and turned over, igniting the weapon and asking who was there. The voice rang out from behind him, calling him Master. Dooku asked who it was, and Qui-Gon made himself visible to him. Dooku's mouth hung open as he asked how this was happening, or at all possible. Qui-Gon expressed that he was one of the living force. His foot stepped forward and he told his former instructor that he couldn't explain much about it. There were lessons that could be taught so that a Jedi might transcend the realm of death. But every Jedi existed within the cosmic force. This was the living. Dooku put his lightsaber away and apologized for failing him. Qui-Gon shook his head, and Dooku's anger grew, believing that Qui-Gon blamed the Jedi. But Qui-Gon told Dooku to put his rage away. This was no one's fault but his own. He failed in the fight, but that didn't mean that someone else had to pay the price because of his mistakes. Dooku asked what he meant, and Qui-Gon stepped forward, his translucent body standing in front of the sun, as he told his master that there was a child, Anakin Skywalker. The boy needed to be trained as a Jedi. Dooku didn't understand, and he especially didn't know why Qui-Gon would think so much about him in the afterlife, but Qui-Gon was adamant that Skywalker was the key to everything. Dooku looked down, and he asked Qui-Gon how he knew this was real or not, and Qui-Gon just asked his former master if it was. Dooku shook his head, believing that he was imagining this entire conversation. He looked away, and the voice of Qui-Gon reminded him of his roots, telling Dooku that the path of a Jedi would be a fulfilling one if he trusted the Force. Dooku turned back and the apparition was gone. He rubbed his head and decided that he would inform Palpatine of his plans. Dooku returned to his room and sent a message to Sidious before going to sleep. When the morning came, Dooku felt confused and unsure. The message from Palpatine encouraged his good friend to take his time. They would need his courage if they wanted to free the galaxy from oppression. These words were so reassuring to him. He felt like he could breathe again. Sidious was such a breath of fresh air, if only Yoda could do that for him. Dooku obviously was neglecting the fact that he pushed Yoda away. Today was the day that the council would return, and the Jedi Master was operating pretty slowly. He wasn't sure where his mind was, but he was sloth and rigid. He ate and attempted to meditate, and then he tried the train but he gave up halfway through each of those, aside from the eating part. He was eating a lot of comfort foods to really ease his heart. Dooku at the end of the day avoided the Jedi Council and took a shuttle out of the hangar and away from Coruscant. He didn't realize there was a Jedi Master following him, one that was tracking his ship with an exterior tracker. Dooku jumped to hyperspace towards the planet of Osis in the Outer Rim territories. It was a peaceful planet, and he'd have time to be alone here. Dooku did send information to the Council informing them of his Barash vow, but they didn't see it because they were busy processing Yaddle's departure from the Council. She was following Dooku at the moment, and she, like Dooku, was in transit to Osis. When Dooku exited hyperspace, he flew his ship down to the surface of the planet and landed next to a small lake. He climbed out of the shuttle and looked around the landscape. It was beautiful and tranquil. He closed his eyes. He could feel how different the force felt. He could feel the vibrance of the world around him. It was so perfect. The sun hit his face and he smiled. He removed his robes until he was down to his tunic. It was much lighter and looser. Dooku seriously was trying to give it a second chance. If he could potentially come to peace with what he had heard the Qui-Gon Jinn from his imagination tell him, then perhaps he could find his love for the Jedi once more. Dooku stepped out onto some stones, sitting lifelessly on the lake, and placed his bare foot down on the first one. It was slippery, but he closed his eyes and he found balance. As he walked forward, Dooku slowly made his way to the last stone. It was larger and it was full enough where he could actually sit on it, and so he lowered himself down to the ground. He could hear more of his instructor's quotes rolling around in his head. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Pass on what you have learned. You will only find what you bring in. Dooku stopped. His eyes opened and he felt the coarse surface of the rock below him as he slowly moved his hand forward and it slipped into the cool water of the lake. Once again, he felt a chill rolled in his spine, similar to the one inside the temple. 
Dooku chose Osis because Qui-Gon and he had never been here before. He could never associate a memory with this place. This was supposed to be a place where he'd find tranquility, but all he found was more confusion. What was it supposed to mean? Dooku's eyes looked around, and he could feel Qui-Gon's presence, similar in fashion to what it was yesterday. Qui-Gon asked his former master if he could find his peace. Dooku shook his head, telling Qui-Gon that he would never find peace without him here. Qui-Gon expressed that to hold on to those who passed away was natural, but to ruin himself over it was not. The time would come, whether it be natural or not, Qui-Gon would never live forever. Dooku sat in confusion, and then he told Qui-Gon that he was never meant to outlive him. Qui-Gon made himself visible to his former instructor and told him that Yoda outlived all of his students. What was the difference? Dooku fell silent. They told Qui-Gon that there were so many things to say, so many more memories to share. Qui-Gon smiled and told Dooku that no matter where he went, he would carry him. As a Jedi, he would be a part of his journey. As a student, he would exist in the lessons passed on to others, and as his friend, he'd be a part of all the ups and downs that life brought him. Dooku smiled and closed his eyes, letting a single tear slip from them. When his eyes opened, Qui-Gon was gone again. Dooku frowned, not because he lost Qui-Gon once more, but because he saw how far he had fallen. He spent so long criticizing the Jedi, blaming them for all the wrong in the galaxy, but here he was, contributing to the terror the Jedi had on the people. Dooku took a deep breath and closed his eyes once more. He needed to meditate, and he needed to find himself once more. He had wronged himself by doing this. He tried to slowly move himself back into the Force. Qui-Gon's apparition was right. What stuck with him the most is what Qui-Gon said about being a student. As a student, Qui-Gon would exist in every lesson that Dooku passed on to others. If Dooku became an agent of evil, an agent of the Sith, he would undo Qui-Gon's life work. That perhaps would be the greatest sin he could ever make. Dooku fell into a silent meditation for a couple more hours before getting up and using the stones to get back to land. He collected some wood and started a fire to keep himself warm. The Jedi Master wondered if he could still make an impact. He had a little hollow recording device and he was recording his thoughts into it. Dooku believed he could use it as a time capsule, but it would probably be used to convince other Jedi to convict him of the murder of Sifo Dyas. Even though Dooku didn't know what he was going to do regarding the Sith, he still had his issues with the Republic. He didn't want to expose Palpatine because he was the key to taking down the Republic and resetting the cosmic balance. Perhaps he could just let Palpatine do what he wanted, though something came to Dooku's mind. Sidious would likely plan to move on without him, perhaps even something worse, like killing him. As he was sitting there wondering, he put his recording device away and leaned his head back on a cot, looking up into the sky and looking at the stars and the moons above him. It was so beautiful here. Dooku thought to himself and wondered if he could ever truly forgive the Jedi. As he thought, he felt something in the forest. His lightsaber ignited and he looked at a shadow walk towards him, as it got increasingly larger, and asked who was there. From the bushes walked a small figure, removing their hood and revealing the concerned face of Master Yaddle. She asked if he was alright. Dooku lowered his lightsaber and extinguished it, asking how she found him. She apologized, but she wanted to tell him personally. He informed her that he sent a message to the council. He was on a bearish vow, one that was not meant to be interrupted. Yaddle again apologized, but she didn't know. She was here because she wanted to make sure he was alright, and she also wanted to tell him that she stepped down from her position on the High Council. He and Qui-Gon were right about so many things. The council failed to recognize that, and she wanted to stand with him and help him. Maybe there was a limited amount of things they could do, but she wished to aid him on this journey, believing it to be one of the most important steps for the Jedi Order in recent history. She then asked if she could join him, and he nodded his head. There was some food sitting next to the fire, and he offered it. She just shook her head and smiled. Yaddle told Dooku that his master was deeply concerned about him, wishing that they would have a chance to speak about Qui-Gon's death. Dooku nodded his head, asking what it was that Yoda said. She told him that the Grand Master felt at fault for it, and even went as far to say that he wished he was the one that perished instead of Qui-Gon. Dooku found that both heartbreaking and endearing. The fact that he thought so highly of his student's life meant everything to him. Dooku asked if that was all that was said, and she told him some other things. Dooku laughed a little as he leaned back. She asked what was funny. He said it was a little comedic how the council came back from such a devastating event to lose one of their council members and lose another to a bearish vow. Surely the council would be buzzing over this. She smiled and saw the little humor in the incident, believing that Dooku's humor 
was always one of the best attributes of his. Dooku thought to himself and his smile faded away, realizing that if he gave himself over to the Sith, he might lose those attributes. The two Jedi spoke for hours until eventually going to sleep. Their conversations ironically drifted away from seriousness and they went to stories. They told fun and witty stories about their adventures, both with Qui-Gon and other Jedi. Yaddo had lost a number of her students over the years, and she expressed that she always remembered the best of them. They were all wonderful men and women. They inspired her to be better every day, and it was in their memory that she decided to step down from the Jedi Council. Dooku was really inspired by her words. In the morning, the two of them woke up at separate times. Yaddo was up first, and she took a stick from a fallen tree and used it to stand still in the water, balancing on one foot and becoming a beacon of stillness and tranquility. Dooku woke up and looked over the water and saw the Jedi Master in her element. She was stood with her arms tilted over her head and her hand lifted upwards towards the sky. Dooku thought that perhaps there was a chance to return to the Order. Yaddo could sense that Dooku was awake and she returned to the camp. Once they had some food, she suggested they go on a hike and he asked why. Yaddo just felt that it could have good implications for them in their conversations, so he obliged. The two of them picked up right where they left off the night before and they spoke. About an hour and a half into their walk, Dooku stopped. They were climbing up a mountain away from their camp. He walked over to the edge and looked down. It was gorgeous. Osis was a paradise, and Yaddle asked, what was really wrong? Dooku paused, and he turned back with shame on his face. The type of shame of someone who had been caught in the act. He told her that he did something wrong, and it may have been the reason that Qui-Gon died. He was unsure though. Yaddle told him that he could tell her if he felt comfortable. If not, she would never pressure him. All Dooku said is that he would like to tell her, but she had the promise that she wouldn't reveal the truth to anyone, and she accepted. When the information was revealed, part of her wished she hadn't made that promise. Dooku told her about Sifo Diaz, Kamino, the clones, and then he told her about Darth Sidious, the master and instructor of Darth Maul. He looked back down over the lake and the beautiful valley as he said these horrid things to Yaddle. She asked him what he would like to do about it, and truthfully, he didn't know. He was conflicted. He believed that he was in the right initially, but now he wasn't sure. Qui-Gon was never supposed to be injured, and surely Sidious would be planning his downfall. Yaddle walked over to the edge and looked down with him. There were a lot of rights and a lot of wrongs. Yaddle told Dooku that his quest to do the right thing wasn't his flaw. He was right for that. How he went about it was what the issue was. But even with that, she couldn't flaw him for making those choices. Yaddle continued and told Dooku, that she would be here by his side, as an ally throughout this entire process, but she would not support the Sith. She reminded him of their earliest lessons. The Sith only cared about themselves, their motivations were inward, and even if what he said seemed like a paradise, Sidious was going to use Dooku until he got what he wanted. This was true, but it all seemed to be perfect, and that was the catch. Gattle told Dooku that no system would ever be perfect. If the Jedi ruled the galaxy, they'd be flawed. If the Republic was a parliament, they would be flawed. If the galaxy was united, it would be flawed. But through all those flaws were the people who made it work. Through all those issues and struggles, there were people binding the galaxy together. It wasn't as black and white as the Senate and the Jedi versus the people. The Order failed, and it failed a lot. But it did not make them the bad in the galaxy. For a unit of 10,000, they did a lot of right. But Dooku was correct, they had their issues. If he truly believed in the Jedi, or if not the Jedi, then doing the right thing, then he knew what the right choice would be. Dooku looked down. He was afraid. She knew he was. But she would be here with them. They could undo his wrongs. They could expose the ruse. And perhaps Dooku could take her seat on the council. He could be the voice of reason to the council full of complacency. She looked up with a smile and told him, if he could convince a 400-year-old Jedi, why couldn't he convince a 900-year-old one? Yaddo was the second oldest in the entire order. If she could be changed, then all of them could be. All they needed to do was approach the issue of the way the council responded. Dooku got down and swung his legs over the edge and asked her if he had betrayed Qui-Gon by doing this, and she shook her head, putting her hand on his shoulder and telling him that we are energy floating along, making challenging decisions. Sometimes our faith is placed in the wrong hands. Sometimes we do wrong by ourselves, but that does not define who we are. Our mistakes are our pillars, and we build upon them. Dooku made his mistakes, but what he made of them decided the legacy he left behind. Dooku smiled and wiped his face, 
turning over to Yaddle and thanking her for being here for him. She just smiled and sat down next to him, looking over the valley in front of them. On Coruscant, Sidious was preparing to make a move to counter everything Dooku might be doing. He knew that Dooku could inform the Jedi about him, so he created a series of recordings, forging their dates and prepared to send them off. Each of these recordings, he used the Force to make himself appear older and weaker, and he spoke about the Jedi and how they were coming for him. He made it appear as if there was a plot to kill him, and the Jedi were planning it for years. Palpatine played the role of the scared old man, and set everything up so he could send it to his closest allies in case something bad did happen to him. Sidious knew he wouldn't lose, but if he could turn the galaxy against the Jedi then perhaps he could take over with the clones or the future Separatists or whatever he wanted. All that mattered is he was prepared to send these messages. Dooku and Yaddle came up with a plan, because he believed that Sidious would counter them if they made a move. So instead of returning to the temple together, Dooku went to his master and Yaddle went to the council. Dooku needed to earn Sidious's trust, and if he got it back, then he would be the apprentice Sidious wanted. Their plan went off without a hitch. Yaddle made her case to the council and informed them of everything she and Dooku accomplished, and she expressed that Dooku was more deserving of her seat than anyone else in the entire Jedi Order. The council was apprehensive of her tone, but she was correct. If Dooku did do this right, then he would expose the Sith and effectively wipe them out. The council rallied around Yaddle and agreed to her stance. They had a lot of work to do on themselves, but if they could get this right, then they'd be able to effectively defeat their ancient rival in the Force. Dooku would go silent from the Jedi for months. Sidious was initially disgusted with this little bearish vow, but Dooku explained to him that he needed to go to a dark planet to feed on the darkness, telling Sidious that he went to Dagobah, which was a nexus of the Force that the Dark Lord hadn't heard of. Dooku explained that Dagobah gave him the strength to cultivate the darkness in ways he had never before. Sidious was actually very impressed, seeing this as a positive from his student, and believing that he made the right choice when it came to Dooku. Because the former Jedi Master had to work undercover for a number of months to gain Sidious' trust back, he began to struggle. He saw a lot of problems again, and he started to slip into the darkness. But by his side was Qui-Gon Jinn. He spoke to Qui-Gon even when he wasn't there, and Qui-Gon was always his source of hope every time he dipped into the darkness. It was really Qui-Gon that kept him safe from the pool of the Sith, because without Qui-Gon, Dooku would have become an agent of evil. Eventually, Dooku would request for Sidious' aid on Sereno. Palpatine didn't really understand, but according to Dooku, he was trying to construct a Sith altar, one that was tied to his masters so that they could be stronger together. Sidious was semi-accepting of this. Tying their altars together would allow them to feed off of each other's darkness. Dooku was starting to show signs of the darkness feeding off his body too. His hair was losing his darkness and he was becoming more obsessive with the power of the dark side. Sidious and he worked for a little over five minutes before the two Sith were ambushed by the Jedi from the High Council. Sidious and Dooku turned to defend themselves, but before Sidious could really understand what was happening, his apprentice shoved his lightsaber through his back, a literal backstab, and Sidious died. Betrayed by the Jedi, he trusted to bring him his evil empire. Dooku was very disfigured in the mind. He bled his lightsaber crystal due to not finding any Jedi during his short stint as Sidious' apprentice. He also needed to speak with the Council regarding Anakin's training. He still hadn't forgotten what Qui-Gon said to him. He just never said a word of it to Yaddle on Osis. The death of Palpatine wouldn't be explained, and it would go as a missing person's case because Sidious was the one who came to Sereno, not Palpatine. The truth is, Palpatine went home one night under the supervision of his guard and was never seen again. His body was disposed inside of the Jedi Temple, where it could be purified and burned. Dooku informed the Council of the various locations he knew Sidious had around the galaxy, and Mace Windu would lead groups of Jedi to do as they did with Palpatine, purify and cleanse. Dooku, on the other hand, had some issues, mentally. The dark side hurt him badly, and Yoda took a leave of absence to be there for his student. He always wanted to be there for his student, and so Master and Apprentice would rekindle their bond where Dooku found his path again. He would tell Yoda about his experience with Qui-Gon, and how he was afraid of losing his mind. Yoda didn't entirely believe him, but Qui-Gon revealed his voice to them once more and expressed his desires to rest now. The Force was theirs to command. All he asks is that Skywalker receive his training, to maintain the balance. To Yoda, this was confirmation that there was so much more about the Force that the Jedi didn't know. And after a month, when the two returned, Yoda would call for a spiritual reset. He didn't want to relocate the Order. Instead, he sent Jedi out to Osis, Dagobah, Lethal, 
and a number of other planets to find the Force and become one with it. The Jedi would be changed for the better because of this. While they were on Osis, Yaddle oversaw Anakin's development, because he was having struggles in the youngling classes. If it weren't for Yaddle, Anakin would have become resentful. She also bridged the gap between Obi-Wan and Anakin, so that they could trust each other. A lot had to be done after Sidious' demise, and one of those things was the halting of the cloning program on Kamino. Luckily it was done before the first batch of clones could be started, Dooku arriving only a day before they started their cloning. It was going to be a tough financial loss for the Kaminoans, but they could kind of live with it. No one else in the galaxy could do what they did, to the level they did. As Dooku returned to become a master on the High Council, he would take Yaddle's spot as Anakin's new instructor, and he'd finally get a chance to meet Obi-Wan Kenobi, the student Qui-Gon often raved about. As Dooku learned, it was a continuation of his legacy that mattered more than almost anything, because while tackling the issues of the galaxy was important to him, it was what was closest to his heart that meant the most. Dooku found solidarity not just with Obi-Wan and Anakin, but Yoda and Yaddle and the rest of the High Council. Palpatine's death would never be solved, and would remain one of the largest mysteries in galactic history. But the Jedi would step in, suggesting that they would no longer serve the Senate if they continued to neglect the people of the galaxy. The Senate didn't take too kindly to this. They believed the Jedi were trying to get away with too much, but a council with Dooku provided evidence of their neglect. They publicly showed the galaxy what kind of a failure the Senate was. The hypocrisy, greed, corruption, and failure costed lives, and it costed the freedom of sentience galaxy-wide. The interim chancellor suggested that Starlight Beacon was their attempt, but Yoda, Yaddle, Yariel Poof, and Oberon Cesis stood before the galaxy as members of an era long gone. They told the people that the Republic continued to shrivel from its responsibility, and they dragged the Jedi down with them. Yoda admitted that he made mistakes over the years and recognized that his complacency was a large part of the issues that took over the Jedi Order, but he could not take responsibility for the greed that the Republic continued to grow from within. He gave the galaxy a chance. If they wanted to see change, they needed to be the change. The collective people were more than either side of the aisle, neither of which serving the people's betterment, rather the betterment of their own political pockets. The threat of the Jedi wasn't hostile and it wasn't a takeover, rather a clean slate, one that would uproot the status quo of the Republic and issue in a new era. One with true leaders and true public servants, not political manipulators. It wouldn't be instantaneous, but one after another in an effort to retain their power, senators picked on each other, issuing out votes of no confidence to each other and crushing them. Ironically, the Senate class of 30 BBY would be dismantled due to their own greed, They'd pull each other out of their seats of power because they feared losing their own individual power so much. What would also not be instantaneous was how long it would take to get the new class of senators to get started. It would take years for their legislation to actually help people. But working in tandem with the Jedi Order focused on righting their wrongs, they were able to get to the Outer Rim at the bare minimum. An effort led by Master Dooku would have Jedi rushing into the Outer Rim and taking down slave rings wiping the Zagirian Empire off the map again, and forcing the Huts to make plea deals with the Republic. Deals that would eventually fall through the floor because the Republic didn't care about gangsters. They were just waiting the approval of a Republic military, one that could be sent out to the Outer Rim for an actual hostile takeover. There would be fights, many of which turning into sieges, but these victories would be generation-defining. It would be with Master Dooku, Master Kenobi, and Master Yaddle that Anakin would find his success. While Obi-Wan was still working to become an actual master, his time with Dooku and Yaddle would prepare him enough to adequately stand in as Anakin's full-time instructor, with oversight of course from Dooku and Yaddle. By the time Skywalker became an adult, there was no separation between the Outer Rim and the Core. It was all Republic territory. The Senate worked hard to bring ambassadors from the Outer Rim worlds into the Senate, so much so that they rebuilt a larger iteration of the Senate building across from the old one it would fill thousands of more star systems that had never seen fair representation. The galaxy felt more whole, and there would be no war. There were disagreements, but once the corporate minds of the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Commerce Build, Banking Clans, and other corporations lost their grip on the Republic, their credits meant nothing. This meant that for people who would have formed a separatist movement, they found solidarity with the Republic. When Anakin became a Jedi Knight, he was respected by his peers and by the Jedi Council. Kenobi would receive the rank of master for overseeing most of Anakin's studies. Dooku would keep his seat on the council and be regarded as the greatest mind of his generation. The spiritual reset that Yoda forced onto the Jedi would have them expanding into the Outer Rim and the rest of the galaxy. To mirror that, 
the Republic and the rebirth of the Starlight Beacon program, and the Jedi became frequent faces in a galaxy now united under the pure determination and will of the Jedi Order. And that, my friends, is our wholesome PP story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons, Benjamin Wells, Jenga Fat Clone, Nick5098, INTJ Recluse, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibb, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grand Eddie Bane, Laliant Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Annika Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Deguin, Santa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kalig, Yanli 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forto's Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For support in the channel, smash that like button, support my lights, check out the Patreon, cool things on there. Special thanks to Endsaber for sponsoring our 125,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. If you want to find out how you can win one of six lightsabers, check the pinned comment down below. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So this one's a bit slower, a lot slower actually. There's not a lot of action going on. I felt like that's what needed to happen. I think Dooku's a very interesting character, and I wanted to really cover his emotions in the days to weeks after Qui-Gon's death and how just the simple change of him going on a bearish vow to think things through would have offered him a space of neutrality. Of course, Yaddle was the wild card in there, and that's kind of the purpose. She's meant to be the inverse of Sidious in the situation, and why Dooku ends up going to the light side. So, anyways, I hope you all enjoy it. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.